This is the Simplify ETF Thought Leadership Forum. As we look at 2020 to 2021, which is our first year at Simplify, it, we couldn't even begin to address this without talking about memes and meme stocks. And I'm excited to bring my friend Carson Block, Lily Frankis, and of course, Kyla Scanlon, who's here with me, um, to discuss this phenomenon that it really feels like something that is possibly never happened before. Now, obviously, things like this have occurred. We have seen things in 2021 that are unprecedented, right? Ranging from whether it's GameStop to AMC to any number of things that have blown up various hedge funds that are otherwise thought of as responsible parties. I figured there is no group that would be better served to, to bring in here than these three. So Carson, you are one of the world's best known short sellers. The you know, rigor of the work that you've done, starting with Chinese frauds, extending across to um, companies throughout markets. You have a really interesting perspective on the general idea of what a short looks like. Should anyone be surprised by what's happened with some of the short positions and the short squeezes that have occurred in 2020? Or is this as unprecedented as it feels? Well, it's definitely, I mean, there are definitely precedents for um, short squeezes. And um, I mean, it, it, they go back much farther than this, but I think a good analog to what happened with GameStop um, is Volkswagen in 2008. Um, also for somewhat, you know, like semi-similar technical reasons, all of a sudden the news broke that there was that, that the, uh, I think it was the Porsche family uh, actually controlled a lot more of the float than was thought. And all of a sudden the, you know, there was a race to cover and the stock ripped. I think it went up like 8X within, uh, within minutes. Um, and some very, very smart investors were caught on the wrong side of that. You know, Tiger Cubs were caught on the wrong side of that. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the Germany's richest uh, person, I guess, uh, you know, no longer was Germany's richest person after that. And <laughs> sadly did, you know, commit suicide right after that happened. So um, there's definitely precedent for, uh, for this sort of thing. So when you think about that, and that is actually one that a minute, the minute I said that, it jumped into my mind that we have seen things like Volkswagen, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But in some ways, the damage was actually much more limited this time around, right? So that was a risk arb trade that was against a large corporation that had a number of positions. GameStop, which was kind of the first indication of this, and, and you know, uh, Lily and I have talked off talked offline about this. We've seen you know many of these things actually kick off kind of in the early stages out of the uh, election in twenty in twenty twenty. It carried into twenty twenty one where it got really really crazy. Lily, do you think the role of options and retail participation in options played a unique role, distinct from some of the stuff we've seen like like you know the wire cards or the Volkswagens where short squeezes have occurred before? Yeah, I mean, the bigger, I guess, role you could understand options playing here is non-recourseable leverage in the sense that, you know, they have a notional delta exposure to the underlying that's much greater than the amount that a retail investor would pay for. And I mean, I've had discussions with people, you know, I guess you could call them the shoeshine boys of the 2020s, where you see this ethos in retail investors where it's like, well, if I lose my money, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, I... Also, on the other side, you know multiple people who made a lot of money off GameStop. You know, we're talking in the millions or in the hundreds of thousands. So it's really, it's different in a way because it gives them access to these products where their downside is clearly very limited and their upside is ostensibly infinite. One of the things that jumps out at me is in many of these situations, like the language that a professional option trader would use, things like what is implied volatility, what is the level of skew, what is the, um, you know, where are you actually buying these things, that tended to get lost because you were dealing with a relatively unsophisticated platform or mm. um, interface in which those, that information wasn't even available, right? So, I mean, if I went on Robinhood mm -hmm. and I, of course, did this and set up an account so I could understand some of what's going on, like, there's no information about what you're actually paying for these options, right? Yeah, I mean, most 
I would say most unsophisticated use of options essentially is a directional bet. You know, I think most actual option traders who specialize in it more look at it as a volatility tool to actually take out and look on realized versus implied volatility. There is some limited use, I would say, of using it as a directional tool, but it's really unique on the retail side because UIs like Robinhood have made it very clear. It's like buy calls if you think it's going to go up, buy puts if you think it's going to go down. And what that's really done is, you know, it works when it works and it's worked this past year a lot. It's also some people have had hard realities when they bought puts on GameStop at 350 and their puts got vaporized. So the dynamics around GameStop and AMC, et cetera, clearly was um, framed in the popular press as being tied to things like the Wall Street bets, our Wall Street bets on Reddit and the spreading of these memes. And, you know, we can all turn into TikTok and hear, you know, various takes from people who are convinced that XYZ is gonna happen. Roaring Kitty, a name I think mm -hmm. most professional investors never thought they would actually say out loud, um, <laughs> you know, figured very prominently in this type of dynamic. And Kyla, you have played a role more on the good side in terms of spreading these memes I and trying so. to help. Yeah, I, I certainly hope so too, but more on the good side in terms of trying to spread some education and poke fun at this. But when you look at the meme culture of Gen Z in particular, and to the millennials a little bit less, I would suggest, do you think that this is actually a driver? Do you think that people are genuinely turning to TikTok for their investment advice? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, I do think that they are. I think that TikTok is just a really accessible platform for them to go to and to just consume information. And oftentimes the level of authenticity that you have with the creators is a lot higher than like a news platform. So you're able to like log on, you're like, okay, I see this person every day, I know how they communicate, and you're able to con like convey, or that you're able to absorb the information the way that they're conveying it to you. So I do think that like helps, but um, you do have sort of like this distribution where you have a lot of uh, people who might be like shilling coins on one side of the distribution and it's sort of like pump and dump. And then on the other side of the distribution, you have hopefully like creators like myself where we're mo more focused on the idea of education. Um, but I do think that social media in general has become a place where people are going for information ab about the markets. And when they, when they seek out this information, I mean, this, is, this feels so foreign to me in so mm -hmm. many ways, but it, it's, and I think that's actually part of the problem that Wall Street at least the, the long-term participants are struggling with is like, are you serious? You turn to a 30-second, you know, TikTok for information about your your investment future. Is it is it that they trust the creators? Is it the irreverence associated with it? The cynicism about the traditional channels? What what, what do you think the the gut? driver is? I mean, I think it's really a perfect storm of all of that. So like there was with GameStop happening, like everybody was like, wow, we don't trust anybody. Like, and you still see that show up in the Wall Street bets forums where it's like, oh my gosh, everybody's lying to us. Like it's this big Ponzi scheme. And so I think like TikTok and the creators on there, it's like, okay, this is just one person. I see them. I know how they interact. Whereas like institutions themselves. So like if you go invest with BlackRock, like you don't really see BlackRock. Like you don't see a person attached to that unless you have a financial advisor, but that's like a whole different level that Gen Z people just don't have access to because they don't have money. And so you don't have like these institutions really speaking to, you know, 17 to 27 ish years old because they don't have the money yet that those people don't. Mm -hmm. um, so institutions just ignore them. And so they have to find other avenues to learn and that ends up being social media. And I think that like just the, with the creator economy in general, that people really are seeking out some sort of connection and the past year with the pandemic has really highlighted that because everybody has missed out on, on that like human connection. So people are really seeking out like these um, individuals where they can learn from because they haven't either gotten that from institutions, don't trust institutions anymore and are just finding different avenues to get the information that they want. So Lily, you're, a, a you know, you have approached this market from a very academic standpoint, right? I mean, your background as a data scientist brought you forward in terms of your awareness. And, and you and I talk an awful lot about, you know, my theories in terms of passive. And, and you've identified what you refer to as options dominance, which is effectively the idea that that large notional then requires hedging going in the opposite direction and can actually force market makers to do things, right, in a, in a market that has friction and low liquidity. 
When you think about this educational process that Kyla is highlighting, you brought up a really interesting point, which is you know, you've got defined loss, right? The most you can lose on an option is X. Is that a prime, like, is, is it effectively just a gambling dynamic? It's an, an attempt to change a life in a way that, um, you know, it's not gonna kill me if I lose 500 bucks or it's not gonna kill me if I lose $5,000, but if I make a million bucks, that really changes my life. Is that, is, is that a, dri a big driver? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest parallel would be like when you look at a business that's about to go insolvent, if you look at something, you know, like the Meriton model, when you essentially view the equity as the call option on the firm assets, you know, you see this asymmetric upside versus downside, which is also why, you know, I'm sure as Carson could expound on, you know, perhaps the most dangerous time to be short of stock is right before it goes bankrupt. And basically what happens is that many of these folks have savings, they have stimulus. I mean, you look last year and the savings rate in the U.S. boomed at the same time as the lockdowns happened. You know, online communities boomed because we were trying to socialize with people. And what that really, you know, brought is you have this camaraderie where you're losing money together. But at the same time, you know, you believe, as Kyla said, the system is rigged anyway. So it's really like you're trying to bet almost like a lotto ticket on getting to the next level of social strata. And you really do see this, especially on places like crypto Twitter. I mean, there's a huge degree of ostentatious wealth being shown. And what it really does, especially for younger folks who have less money and would gravitate more toward these super high yield, super high risk investments, you're essentially seeing it as a lotto ticket. So Carson, you have familiarity with um, markets where there have been less sophisticated investors. You spent a lot of time in China. You spent a lot of time dealing with those types of dynamics. It, is this behavior consistent with kind of what we, if I go back to 2015 or 2014, like the stories we heard were, well, the Chinese are just gamblers, right? You know, they, they want to gamble on stuff. Is this a reflection of that type of change in the U.S. markets? Yeah, no, I, it's it's interesting because when Lily talked about lottery tickets, I mean, that really resonated with me because when I first started doing this as an activist short seller in 2010, and these were total frauds from China, I mean, just the worst of the worst, and I would get so much vitriol directed at me, um, you know, especially over email, and I would try to reason with these, and these were usually retail, um, I would try to reason with them a little bit like, hey, don't be mad at me, be mad at chairman so-and-so who's lied to you and stolen your money. And I mean, look, predictably that seldom worked, even after, in some cases, after the companies were, uh, you know, were actually, in for there was an enforcement action against the management and the companies for fraud, the same people would still come at me. And when I thought about it, I realized, Okay, this is what it. So I remember my my first in, my job in investment banking in 1999 when I was at CIBC World Markets and I was miserable every day. And there were a few days when I would go in, I'd stop at the coffee shop in the base of the rest in the base of the building, and I'd buy a lottery ticket because it was like 10 or 20 million. Mm -hmm. And then I would spend my free thought moments fantasizing about going in and quitting the next day. And that's really what I came to realize like a lot of people who are punting on Chinese stocks are doing, like there's some hole in their life and they're using, they're buying lottery tickets. And it was like, I was taking those lottery tickets out of their hands, tearing them up in front of their faces and just dropping them on the ground. And that's where I felt the vitriol came from. Um, going back to China, you ask about that. It's it, when I first moved over there in 1998, right after graduating from university, I went over there to try to open up an equity research firm and I came to realize that, I mean, and this wasn't for fraud reasons, but there was just nothing investable literally in the domestic markets in that time. And a big dynamic I felt was that the, the policymakers wanted to keep the markets there hyper speculative because if there was this possibility that, hey, you go into that brokerage firm tomorrow and you guess right or whatever, it can change your life. That kept people out of the streets. I mean, that was my assessment mm -hmm. as a 22. 23 year old in 1998. So um, I do think that that is a common thread through all of this. 
So I mean, actually, sorry, go, just, no, go, no, go ahead, Lily, please. I was going to jump in. I mean, a big part of these, as what Carson said, scams, is this idea of fundamental variance. And I posted about this on Twitter about bubbles because I, I always find it hilarious that so many people are angry about bubbles. Very few people try to understand what's going on. <laughs> but basically, fundamental variance or this idea of a better tomorrow where you see these firms that could be valued at zero or infinity, and you see a lot of this, of course, in crypto currently, is what really powers investor sentiment, especially at the retail level. You know, retail tends to be much more risk loving, especially at the sectors of, or demographics that invest heavily. And what happens is that the scams usually are the ones that promise the most. I mean, that's usually what happens, and that's what attracts people because even if there are red flags, you know, usually they're pretty priced pretty low. You can start with pretty quick investments. You usually grow them over time and lead to that kind of emotional attachment Carson's talking about. And what happens is, you know, you might in the back of your mind know it's a scam, but it still might not be a scam. And that's also what triggers, you know, when there is any news which seems to validate that this company is legit and it happens occasionally, then you see this hyper growth in price as everybody piles in. Well, it, but I, I would but I would yeah. I would push back on one thing there, which in micro cap world, I think the kind of more seasoned micro cap retail, like I think they get that these things are scams and they don't care. You know, like it's not it, it almost doesn't matter that it's a scam to a lot of them, it, you know, especially if you don't, if you live in a world in which enforcement is pretty sporadic, which is the world we live in, then um, I think the more seasoned retail punters are in on the joke, whereas the, the you know, the newer to the game ones might not be. So I, I agree with 90% of what you said. It's just that little corollary there where I don't know that it matters if it's a scam, if there's no enforcement. Yeah, I mean, those are the, I would say those are the investors, probably, I would put myself, you know, in that bucket, who take advantage of momentum and are have pretty short hold times where they're essentially looking for that pump, which at that point, you don't really care the fundamentals of the company, especially when there's sufficient liquidity. And it's essentially you are buying this on the bet that other people will pile in. Well, and, and I think that's actually a really interesting link because when I think about how people react to finding out that it is a fraud, right? So Carson, you, you brought this up and the perception is you're tearing up their lottery tickets, not that they bought a bad ticket or that it's somebody else's fault for mm -hmm. lying to them, that you're effectively destroying their dream, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when they lose the money? Is, it, is, is there a learning process or is it, well, Numbers didn't come up this week. I'll try again next week. You know, you, I'd like to think it's the it's the former, but I've had experience that tells me it's the latter. Um, I, look, I guess it's I guess it's person by person, but and there there's some people um, I've received emails from over the years who I don't know. I mean, they're they could be th these might be true where they're saying, oh, my kid's college fund was all in you know, this one 200 mar million market cap Chinese stock and, you know, you destroyed that. Um, I don't know, like, what does that person need to learn to make responsible financial decisions? I mean, you don't have to be a seasoned investor to know that putting your child's college fund entirely in a speculative Chinese stock is speculative. <laughs> so I don't know. Your eloquence knows about no bounds, Carson. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. So, Kyla, on, on that front, when you think about the communication and the information that's being shared, do is there an element of learning or thoughtfulness around this, or is it is it nihilism effectively? Like, you know, the the thing that always jumps out at me is the dynamic of, of what's referred to as loss porn, right? So I'm going to show my losses yeah. to demonstrate participation in the community. I, I can't help but think about fringe religious movements, things like the flagellists, right, who, you know, would parade through, you know, medieval cities whipping themselves and how much blood they drew was actually a sign of, you know, their commitment to the cause, right? 
is this the same thing? Is it, is it just a community that you're making a sacrifice in that if you lose, you demonstrate that you're really a member, and if you win, well, you've changed your life, so you can't lose either way. Um, maybe. I mean, I think like the dynamic that Wall Street Bets had at the beginning of GameStop was really interesting because it was sort of like this collective belief driving the value of an asset, which was just like the fundamental reason why GameStop sort of went up at like the very, very baseline level. Um, and it was like even now you see with AMC, like there'll be some comments where it's like talk about AMC, like AMC squeeze, like AMC forever. And there's a certain level of loyalty that they have to that community and that stock, but it's not to the company, which is really interesting. Like, yes, they'll, 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 they'll like talk about AMC, whatever, GameStop, but it's more so like we're in this together and we're doing this to like fight against the establishment. So I don't know from the like point of loss porn if that's like, I think that's important because it's like we lose together if we do lose, but I think it's also people like trying to find that common thread of community because I think that's what's sort of been missing from society for a little bit. Like ever since the Industrial Revolution, we've been really individualistic. And so I think people are trying to find community and they're doing it through financial markets because that's something that they're like exploring together, like Christopher Columbus style. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think it's a different way for people to um, sort of tap into that human need to, to, to be with others, which is weird, but yeah. Is there an element of, um, you know, kind of where are the parents, right? You know, like, like, is it that financial education has deteriorated so much? David Einhorn and I were talking earlier today about, you know, the way I was trained was you're getting a share in a company, right? And so I would want to evaluate the prospects for the company in total. It feels like that's, that, that awareness is not there at all, that there's this sense that companies are this kind of amorphous concept, that it doesn't actually really exist and that you can will a share price regardless of the underlying fundamentals if we just believe, right? If we, we tap our heels together or we all you know, sing a song you know, and believe and demonstrate our belief that you know, it, it, it can levitate. Is there, is there just a fundamental lack of education and can education change it? Uh, Lily, I'd, I'd love to hear your reaction to that. I mean, I've, I've said this previously, but essentially, you know, and this is probably where I'll digress most with Carson. If you look at the facts of what happened this year, retail probably at least enough won, and enough people made a lot of money that they justified their beliefs. So there's enough evidence that many people got rich, especially with crypto, with meme stocks. Why would they stop? That's that's my number one you know point. If you believe retail is driving this, why would they stop doing this as long as it works? And you know when we look at it from an educational perspective, I've talked a lot about liquidity bubbles. I mean, you could argue that part of this doing is the fact that there's a ton of people in the markets now. You can spread information rapidly through Reddit, through Twitter, through other platforms, basically online. I wrote a piece in January called Trading Salience, which talked about the meme stock phenomenon and the fundamental reasons for why I believe GameStop was chosen of any stock on the planet. And if you read it carefully and you read it what the fundamental reasons for it were, it looks like a cult. Yeah. And I've talked about cult assets, you know, we've talked about the rise of QAnon. It's basically identical and I didn't obviously at the time want to speculate and say this is going to turn into a cult but <laughs> you see evidence of cult-like behavior and it really depends what perspective you're looking at it if you're looking at it from the sake of trying to squeeze out as much yield as possible or chasing returns why wouldn't you bet on a cult if you look at previous stocks like you know an Apple or Tesla holders got in essence greatly rewarded. I know this is completely against the idea of an efficient market or rewarding the good guys, which is really the ethos of the short seller. And I agree. But at the end of the day, as an investor, you would be hard pressed, unless you're very specialized or following a mandate, to say that your fundamental view is you want to just support good companies. You are trying to make money in the markets, and this seems to be working. So I want to go to Carson on that because, you know, we're all familiar from the traditional investment standpoint of looking to invest in companies that have cult-like followings for their products, 
right? So Apple, for example, or you know, people absolutely love Coca-Cola, right? To use a Warren Buffett trade from the you know the 1980s, right? So when you when you think about this dynamic of a cult and cult-like behavior, as Lily's talking about before, have you seen this before in securities, Carson? Is there is this something you have encountered as a short seller before where people effectively believe in a stock as compared to the products? Um, okay, so can't give you a direct answer there. But first thing is, I'm, I mean, I will say, actually, I completely agree with everything Lily just said there. Um, so there's, yeah, there's actually, yeah, no point of disagreement. And um and look, I've I've long said, I mean, ever since I started doing this, I've long said that you, the, you've got a company with a fundamental value, and then you have these shares that kind of swirl around that are often very much disconnected from that fundamental value. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, I think the best analog that I've experienced to this time would be the internet stock bubble. But um, I mean, I can't, I can't think of specific companies, you know, given that that was 20 years ago, give or take, that where I'd say, oh yeah, this is just you know the same sort of adulation uh, as, as evidence right now toward GameStop. Well, that's just like X, Y, Z back in the day. But um, I think there are a lot of analogs here between um, the internet stock bubble and what's going on today in, mm -hmm. in meme stocks um, and you know and certain other beloved stocks. But the you know, one thing, and this is actually, um, you know, I, I, Andrew Left made this point to me when we were talking about what was going on. And, you know, this was, he was, he was obviously on the losing side there of GameStop. But, you know, he said that at least in the internet stock bubble, you had useful things come out of it. Um, you know, we had a lot of fiber laid and, you know, just things, there were a number of things that were ahead of their time. Whereas, you know, you look at meme stocks and it's, it's hard to really see what's, you know, super useful or innovative that's going to benefit society that comes from this. Now, look, maybe in 10 years from now, we'll look back and I will have totally missed something. But I'd say that's, I'd say that these periods seem, you know, history never repeats, but it rhymes. Um, these periods do seem to rhyme, at least to me. Well, it's, it's interesting. So earlier today, we had David Einhorn on the stage and he brought up the analogy of he, he was highlighting that America Online in the dot-com cycle made possible the argument that other dot-coms could become profitable and could become mm -hmm. successful, right? I, I thought that, and, and he drew the analogy to Amazon today, right? So many market participants shorted Amazon under the argument of it doesn't make any money, the margins in retail are terrible, et cetera. And it's obviously turned into one of the most successful companies in history. Today, I would argue, broadly speaking, that you sit, and, and David is spot on on this, that you broadly see people moving towards the idea of saying, well, how do you know it's not the next Amazon? How do you know it's not X, Y, Z, right? Effectively, the realm of the possible has been expanded dramatically because of that singular event. Now, the fact that an Amazon emerged doesn't raise the probability of anything else. But what's the reaction to, to that observation? I saw some nodding in, in, on my panelists here. So, Well, I, I'll just say you know, quickly, short, activist short sellers have done very well this year um, shorting these like EV and you know, hydrogen vehicle um, you know, pretenders. So you, they get a lot of attention initially, meaning the stocks when they go public via SPAC. Uh, because everybody thinks it's Tesla and they want to get in on the ground floor of the next Tesla. But um, these have been successful uh, for the most part as as shorts. So, I mean, I, I think there are other dynamics at play there. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, it's th these, these stocks are far from unassailable, the ones that are trying to be the next XYZ. I mean, you show that the truck is rolling down the hill and it's not actually under power, you know, that's good for, I mean, it should be good for down 99%, but, you know, down 40 is the new down 99, I guess, in today's world. Well, and it's, it's interesting. So you're obviously bringing up, you know, Nikola, um, which is kind of 
was the early poster child mm -hmm. for SPAC success, and I would, would argue influenced a lot of what we've seen. When I look at the holders of Nikola, and, and you know, Carson, you and I have talked about this extensively, front page holders include you know, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund that effectively just went out and bought you know, crazy amounts of all sorts of EV companies because of their reliance on oil and a desire to ESG out their portfolio, right? Um, Vanguard and BlackRock continue to buy because they are in the indices despite the fact that they're known frauds, right? And Nikola is a, a fantastic example of this where it still has a market cap in the billions, right? It's about four and a half billion, if I remember correctly. Historically, for a short seller, that's almost unfathomable, right? I mean, to have an actual fraud with no revenues, no product, no relationship anymore, you know, and continuing to put out these ridiculous news presses that are like, you know, oh, the truck will eventually come out, right? How do you think about the intersection of those those dynamics, right? Where there's just money that is going in without any insight whatsoever in terms of what the company go, does, and, and everyone's participating in it. I, look, it's not just in those things. Um, I mean, we're, we've been short, we no longer are. A company in France where our read called Solutions 30, our research led to the uh, big four auditor failing to issue an audit opinion and they said that we think there could be wrongdoing and there could be fraud. So the company dismissed the auditor, um, hired an auditor of last resort um, out of Luxembourg and isn't even going to bother having the 2020 accounts audited. And they're out there giving guidance. And I mean, the thing's got like an 800, 900 million U.S. market cap. I mean, it's all over the world. It's um, it's not just EVs. It, it really I mean, just the value of evidently being public is probably, you know, north of $500 million. I mean, you know, the way I look at it. So it's it's depressing, I mean, as a short seller in some ways, but on the other hand, um, there's no shortage of potential, of really bad, bad companies out there. It's just, there's so much apathy that I think that's the biggest problem that we face as short sellers, is the apathy. Exactly the phrase that David used earlier today to describe it as well, this apathy that no one seems to care. Lily, you were gonna say something. I was going to say that it's probably partly related to flows in a sense. You know, yeah. if you think about it, if I ask you this question, let's say you bought Nikola right now and you could buy a call option on it. I'm guessing it's still on NASDAQ or something. You're betting, let's say, $100 for thousands of dollars upside. Someone is still buying the underlying shares and supporting the structure. Similarly, if I gave you the thought experiment where maybe... I said you have to buy Nikola and you can never sell it. I think the calculus would change a lot for a lot of people and you'd see market caps deflate substantially. Well, exactly to your point, there's two buyers there, Lily, right? Because you have, if I buy the call option, the market maker is, it's not their job in the options market to figure out whether it's a fraud or not, right? So they're going to mechanically hedge it by buying shares. And at the same time, an index player is doing the same, right? I mean, they are buying in, in the case of uh, Vanguard or others, they're, they're buying a million plus shares in the last quarter, right? If I look at the last reporting period. So you're talking millions of dollars that are being deployed and there's not that many shorts. I mean, Nikola is a, is a great example of a company that is heavily, heavily shorted, which creates actually conditions of a potential short squeeze. It, Carson or Lily, could you guys talk a little bit about like why that is, what's actually going on there? Well, I mean, look, obviously in the case, in the case of GameStop, um, that one was somewhat obvious. And what I think a lot of people overlook is that I think it was four months before the squeeze occurred on Wall Street bets, somebody laid out the reason why it was squeezable and, mm -hmm. and, and stated that, hey, you know, if there's a bunch of out of the money call option buying, the Delta hedging will cause this to squeeze. And it was just a matter of, you know, your float was yay big. And then if you took Michael Burry um, and the uh, the Chewy's guy out of you know out of that supply, then the float was really small, and you had Melvin, which for tax reasons was not covering its short. So you had this massive uh, short relative to the actual supply of stock, and yeah. So this was you know so that that's a that's an outlier. I mean, most of the time, even pre GameStop, I mean, you wouldn't see 
such large short positions relative to the float and even relative to the supply, the real supply of stock. Do you think, uh, I'm sorry to, to interrupt before Lily goes, because I want to make sure that we, we come back to this, but on that point, do you think that the behavior of short sellers has now changed because of the experience of GameStop and other meme stocks? What short sellers? <laughs> <laughs> That's your answer. Yeah, yeah. Lily, I, I interrupted you. Yeah, I was going to talk about that. I mean, people wondering why, for instance, GameStop and AMC are still in the clouds. I mean, you see GameStop is, what, 173 today? And I'm going to talk about this from two respects. One, there is no short pressure on it at this point. You know, it's just going to stay there until long-term sellers try to, you know, get out. And because this, the float is pretty small and a lot of it is retail held with what you call true believers, it will take a while, even if there is no more squeeze. And the secondary reason is really that you're seeing that for these highly shorted names, or even for the non-ones, there's just fear. Nobody wants to take up the role of the short seller for a GameStop or an AMC because you saw some pretty famous explosions. I mean, you could see them, you know, I trade, so I could see them on the tape. You would see these gigantic bursts when AMC was going up where you know someone was just blown out of their position. So, Kyla, when you think about the information diffusion, is the TikTok generation aware of this mm -hmm. stuff? I mean, are they, or, or yeah. the conversation we're having, does it go outside of this room, sort of? <laughs> um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, I, yeah, I mean, obviously, like Carson and Lily are absolute experts here. I think that. Like when you think about TikTok and sort of the people who are making content on, on TikTok, like it's not Carson and Lily, and that's sort of, a, I think, a flaw. Yeah. Like, and so for me, like I think of myself as like, I'm just an anecdote, but like I think of myself as more of a curator. I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. The only obligation I have is to like explain it to people the best that I can, but you have a lot of people who are like trying to pass themselves off as a Carson and Lily and being like, oh, actually GameStop went up because Citadel and Robinhood are in cahoots. And like that's, and everybody's um, working against the system. And so I think there's a lot of like misinformation out there. And because of the information diffusion that TikTok allows, you have a lot of just confusion about what actually is happening. So when I think about that, the, the obvious question becomes, I mean, this is very clearly improper communications, right? Um, you are presenting yourself, you're providing investment advice, et cetera. What would happen if the SEC cracked down? <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know how they would do it. I mean, I guess like, so TikTok itself has like cracked down and if you say the word crypto, like your video gets put into review, um, which, in, which is interesting because TikTok's trying to go into crypto. But I think like the SEC, like the whole thing with Gary Gensler and like investor protection, like that's what he continues to iterate on. Um, but I think that they just don't really know how to handle social media and how information disseminates through social media. So I don't really know like what guardrails that they could put up. Like they could be like, oh, actually you can't talk about finance at all. And like if you mention a stock ticker, like we're gonna strike down your video. But I just don't think the, the tools are in place and the frameworks are in place to do that. If the SEC were to actually do that, what do you think the TikTok generation would do? I mean, I, I look to Donald Trump trying to ban TikTok because of yeah. the Chinese influence, <laughs> yeah. and I saw the outrage in my kids and their friends, yeah. right? Like, oh, you know, it's just like crazy, basically the Bart, you know, Bart Simpson old man yells at Bitcoin yeah. sort of framework, right? What do you think the reaction would be? So I think like there's a couple of things. So Tom Sosnoff, who uh, works with, T who founded Tasty Trade, said that GameStop was like really good for the markets because it got more people talking about the markets. And so I think at the end of the day, like TikTok is really just an entry point for people. It's like top of funnel for them to start investing. So I think like like there would be a response to losing TikTok, but I also think like even though there's a lot of really bad content out there, it's still important to have the content out there in the first place. So I do think it, even though it's stupid and like there's a lot of people shilling coins on there, it's still important that people are able to like talk about this stuff and you're able to like reduce the gates that are put up by institutions or whoever is out there. Um, but I do think that there would be a lot of like, like right now I think that we're kind of at this inflection point in society where it's becoming very anti-establishment. Like I see it in my peer group, I see it with people who are younger than me, like the, 
the, there's a feeling that the government and like structures have, have failed them. And so I think that like if you sort of ban this one tool that they're using to interact with their friends and to be creative, whatever, um, such as TikTok, like that's gonna make a lot of people really enraged. So it would effectively be viewed as Robin Hood stopping trading in GameStop, right? It would be viewed very negatively. Yeah, and I, it would just be like, I mean, I don't know what people would do about it. Like, I don't think people are gonna like run into the streets and be like, give us TikTok back. Um, but I, I do think that there would be a lot of um, confusion and like questioning of, of why. And so is, is it a fundamental lack of trust or faith in the incentives or the motivation of regulators i mean is it are, are the what i see or what what it feels like at least from the outside not being part of your generation is any attempt at investor protection is basically treated as you're trying to keep me out of the old boys club right yeah. you're trying to protect the profits for your friends and you know those who will hire you when you come out i mean it's it's just totally cynical in yeah. the interpretation yeah, I mean, I, so I think like to the to the main point is like there's so much information out there, and we're not given any tools to like learn how to synthesize the information. We're just like thrown into the fire, and so I think like everybody's really aware of like the dysfunctionality of the government, and like um, not not calling out the government yeah. right now, but like 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 it's fundamentally like like with the debt ceiling, for example. So I think like um, people are just really aware of like the flaws in the system, and so when the SEC comes in and they're like, well, we just want to protect you, it's like, well, what have you been doing this whole time? Like, where were you when X, Y, and Z happened? And, well, like, why don't we have any money? Like, why can't I afford a house? And so I think it's, like, that kind of stuff where it feels like society has essentially, like, and I think, you know, you, we were talking about it earlier, like, you feel the same way being Gen X. Like, you just feel like society wasn't built for you. And, um, and like, maybe that's, like, a silly framework to have. But I do think that that's sort of the underlying feeling that a lot of people um, around this age have, yeah. Well, so I, I would actually, and Carson and I are both Gen X, um, you know, I would suggest that the Gen X interpretation is more along the lines of a cynicism that we just expect to be, mm. to, to lose in the process, right? So if you bought a house in the 2005, you know, 2006 framework, which would have been the peak of, of the, the Gen X, you know, home buying, well, of course it, we lost them, right? And of course, you know, we didn't get protected. Um, and I think, our generation generally would look at social security and be like, of course it's not gonna be there for us, yeah. right? You know, of course it'll be taken away. Um, whereas this feels more actively hostile. Yeah. This is how dare you try to step in and protect me. We are really actually, you know, trying to keep me out, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Does that feel fair? Yeah, I, I, th I think so. So I was talking to somebody about this the other day and like uh, the whole thing is like I don't think a lot of people understand sort of like the underlying fundamental of like even what a market is. Like you, your whole entire life, you're never even really taught like, okay, this is supply and demand. This is how you should interact. You're, like even when you get paid by a company, like you don't see it, it just shows up in your, mm -hmm. your, your bank account. Like so I, I think that there's just a lot of like gaps in, in knowledge and those gaps are in people's heads, those gaps turn into like, oh, this is deception. Like they're not, they're trying to keep us out. Um, so I think that ends up being the issue. And now that you have like Twitter, you have Instagram, you have um, TikTok, like everybody's sort of talking about that stuff and you can scroll on and into Lily's early point about QAnon, like the, <laughs> you can just like wander down a road that sort of um, maybe reinforces the beliefs that you already have. So I think like it could, it is probably more hostile because you have more information and there's so much information and it's almost overwhelming and you can't synthesize it. Uh, so it just ends up like fermenting. So that's a, that's a frightening concept. And you know, I've talked about this in the context of, you know, we're 40 years into the Reagan revolution. Mm -hmm. Deregulation has been treated as a, an, an unquestioned good for the most part. The dynamics around regulation being instituted following 2008, I, I just did a segment with Matt Stoller on, on Real Vision, where you know, Matt highlighted that you know, ironically, we chose to regulate the banking system by making the existing banks even more powerful, right? Yeah. You know, preventing competition, <laughs> locking it down, et cetera. Carson, when you think about this, do you look back on the GFC in the same way? Do you see, I mean, do you, have you become much more cynical about the role of regulators and authorities and the ability for government to be a force for good in this process? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, 
force for good. Uh, <laughs> you can the, stop there if you want. That's, <laughs> well, it, right before I, I, I joined this, I was actually having a conversation with somebody who used to be in politics, and I made this point that I don't really feel like we're in a very deregulated place. I mean, yes, maybe relative to the 1970s, but there's been a lot of re-regulation. And increased regulation, complexity of legislation, et cetera, that favors consolidation in large enterprises. And so in the abstract, yes, I'm in favor of a less regulated environment, but the, pro the thing is you need enforcement. Okay, so we live in this day and age where we have lots of legislation and regulation with innumerable complexities, and we have very little enforcement. That is the worst of all worlds. So I think that that, you know, that lends itself to too big to fail, too big to jail, and moral hazards, and basically the same thing time and time and time again. So I, I feel like you know, watching COVID was really watching a rerun of the, of the financial crisis. And you know, we just bailed everybody out who had made their balance sheets too fragile, kind of like we did last time. And what are they going to do next time? They're going to make their balance sheets really fragile again. And I don't know. I mean, I, in theory, there's a point at which these bailouts would no longer succeed, but um, that might be, you know, many generations from now that we find that out. But well, I mean, we're not, that's the problem. Lots yeah. of regulation, no enforcement. To Kyla's point earlier about a lot of people just don't even know what a market is, right? The growth of big business, I've, I've made this point repeatedly elsewhere, right? If I go back to 1945 and the GI Bill, roughly half of those who participated in the GI Bills created their own business, right? And so there was a dynamic of entrepreneurship and, and a very direct link with your parents had a small business, right? Your parents founded a company. Um, and so as, a, as an individual, you saw that. Today, the rates of entrepreneurship are effectively non-existent, less than 5% entrepreneurship in our economy. COVID has, you know, it's too early for the statistics, but I would be very hard pressed to believe that COVID hasn't changed that dramatically to the, make it even worse. And, you know, entrepreneurship is, hey, I'm an Uber driver, right? Um, you know, that's owning your own business, right? I mean, I'm my own boss when I'm a contractor for Uber or I work for Upwork or, you know, I do Fiverr jobs or whatever, right? Does that feel like part of the problem, effectively, that there is this, separation and almost this magical nature of like, hey, money shows up in my account because I showed up at work or I checked in on online to, you know, my boss sort of thing? That's that's a pretty meta question. Um, <laughs> I mean, certainly for people, you know, I now I'm, I'm, this will be really far afield, but I might not be understanding uh, your question. Um, I, I left San Francisco some years ago and I was really disheartened with the way that that city was governed. And I realized after going through this one experience that I think the people who hold political power there are people who've been in rent control apartments for a few decades and they've got two and three bedroom apartments. They rent out those other bedrooms at market rates and money basically falls into their lap. And I think that that disconnects you from reality. By the same token, mm -hmm. I've talked to billionaires who are totally disconnected from reality as well. So. I think, and that's probably because nobody has any real career upside in telling them when they're like off the rails. So maybe different reasons uh, or different direct causes for the disconnection from reality. But yes, I think that if to the extent money is falling into your lap, it's pretty hard to understand the way the world actually does work and form and you know, have well-founded opinions on policy. It's interesting because, you know, just jumping in, it goes back to the idea of a marginal value of a dollar. I mean, if you look at someone who's middle class, for example, a dollar will mean a lot more to you at 75,000 a year, you know, 50,000 a year, depending on what state you're in, than maybe if you have 500,000 or 5 million or 5 billion and you're seeing that, especially in smaller markets, it does cause distortion. I mean, you could argue that the NFT bubble in crypto is primarily driven by a lot of these nouveau riche who, you know, they may have invested early, may have this insane amount of new wealth and prices just do not, there is no thing, 
ideally as, you know, a fundamental price there. There's Because at this point, you don't really value your marginal dollar. So what does it matter to you if you just put it all in, you know, a picture? There's very definitely that dynamic. There's also only so much you can spend money in, in some of these areas on, right? So transmitting it back to fiat is often a challenge. And, and mm -hmm. Reinvesting in your community, going back to the flagellists or the lost porn dynamic, you know, is a way to theoretically make even more money, right? Um, if Kyla, if there was one thing, and we're going to wrap up on this, but if there was one thing that you would want to put into just an unbelievable kick-ass TikTok to help you know, your peers and your generation understand how markets work and what, you, what, what you're thinking. What, what, what would be that topic? Like, what, what do you? Yeah, I don't know. I, so I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm like trying to think of a company idea and like I've been working on a company idea around this like financial education concept because like it's so interesting. I feel like there's so many like financial companies out there, but nobody's been able to like really solve financial education and there's like no foundational layer. Um, and so I think it really like might stem from like this is how a market works. Like this is supply and demand. Um, if like if you have not enough apples, your apple prices are going to have to rise. So I think just explaining like really those core concepts and doing it in a way that people can anchor to it is like super important. Uh, because I think like the the issue with financial education and sort of like what might be going on here is like. You know, when you're in the third grade and you like don't learn how to add, and then math classes keep on happening to you, like you're gonna feel really lost and really left behind because you don't have anything to anchor to. So I think with like financial education, there's just not anything for people to anchor to, and so they're like, okay, well, I don't really know like how markets work, so how can I like learn what a stock is and what a dividend is? So I think like that core concept of like what is a market and why does it exist and who plays in the market is is probably what I would want to talk about first, at least at the foundational level. Well, I, I would love to see you do that. I actually, um, uh, one, one of my friends, uh, um, Alexander Fernandez, is, uh, he, he texted me earlier, he's like, you gotta get the metaverse in there, right? And, <laughs> um, one of the points I guess that I would raise is, is this issue of can we improve education? You, you highlighted the mathematics component to it, certainly in education around economics and the ability to tap into that sort of stuff. We need to figure out a better way to help people understand this. Because what I see is people basically saying, you know, well, what is a market? Oh, it's totally manipulated, right? Like that's that's yeah. effectively the meme yeah. that exists around. It. Like that's not answering the question. That's making an assertion yeah. about the character of a market, and it really feels like we have lost the ability to more broadly explain that. Like, well, wait, those are two separate statements. Let's, yeah. Let's figure out what a market is supposed to be first before we start declaring that it's completely manipulated. Carson, Lily, Kyla. Thank you so much for joining us. This was absolutely awesome. Again, I couldn't have I can't think of a group of three people that I would be better served in having on this panel. You guys have all been amazing. And thank you for joining us today and supporting the, the cause of Coney Island Prep and helping to improve some of the education that, uh, that we talked about. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.